Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Brings back memories of being in Africa about three years ago. Amen. Amen. Me and my friend uh, Joe DeMauro, we traveled to Uganda, Africa together. It's been about 10 days there about three years ago. And got a great love for the African people. Amen. Amen. And I um, want to thank um, Pastor Blamaja for inviting us to come and um, travel with my wife Melissa and our friends Joe and Bernadette, our son Seth. And, his friend Deontay. Uh, it's good to be in the house of God in Saxon, New Jersey. Amen. And, um, you know, as we were coming down, um, my wife was um, looking through um, some of the news uh, that transpired just this morning. Yes. How many knows that we're living in a, a dangerous place called the world? Amen. Yes, we are. Even this morning in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, about 9 o'clock this morning, three more police officers were gunned down. This happened about a week ago in Dallas. I believe there was five and several more wounded. We had that great catastrophe over in uh, Nice, France, where 80 people were run down by a... 84. 84 people by a, a crazy man in a truck. Yes. Bible speaks of, of perilous times that we're living in. Yes. Death comes quickly. You're driving in your car. Another car pulls out in front of you. That could be the end. Yes. You take a flight to another country on vacation. Like there were several people um, in Nice, of France, there. Several of them were from America, yes. Texas. Yes. They're on vacation, yes. trying to have a good time. Death comes quickly. Mm. You go to the doctor, you're not feeling well. The doctor runs some tests. He tells you you got a bad heart. He tells you there's cancer that's filling your body. He tells you your lungs not operating the way that they need to be operating. Death comes quickly. You know, I think of back up quite a bit, a long time ago, several years ago, I was painting a house alongside an old graveyard. And it was great, and I just, I had some time, um, I was working hard that day, and I just took a little stroll through that graveyard. And I know it might sound weird, but, you know, as I strolled through that graveyard and I began to look at the gravestones, you know, there was hundreds of gravestones there that day. And they were old gravestones. And some of them, you couldn't even hardly make out what was, you know, what was originally intended to be set on those gravestones. And some of them were three or four hundred years old. You know, and some of the lives I would read that, you know, they were 10 years old, 15 years old, 20 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old, different ages of people. Some lived a long time, but some lived a real short life. And the Bible teaches us that it's appointed unto men once to die, but after that the judgment. We're all rushing towards an appointment one day that we'll meet to stand before our Maker and give an account of how we've lived this life, whether good or bad. We're going to stand before our maker one day. And death comes quickly. Bible says our life is but a vapor. It appears just for a little while. And then it vanishes away. The psalmist says, he, he said, teach me to number my days. That I might apply my heart unto wisdom. No, the average lifespan is 70 or 80 years old. If by reason of strength you live to be 80, you're doing really good. And as a young person, that might seem like a real long time away. But as I look in the mirror, and I'm nearing 60 now, it seems like just yesterday that I was a young person like you or like him. It came quickly. 40, 50, 60 years, they just flew by. You know, and, and I wasn't fortunate enough to grow up in a Christian family and serve Christ my entire life. I grew up in a family of, 
a dad and a mom that didn't go to church. And if they did go to church, it'd be once a year on a Sunday morning, on an Easter Sunday, or maybe on a, a Christmas service. Maybe once a year they would make their way to church to punch their religious time clock once every year. But they had no relationship with Christ. They never read the Bible to me and my sister growing up. We didn't pray together. We didn't worship God together. We knew nothing about the things of God. And how many knows when you grow up in an environment like that, that you're going to learn to do things that you ought not to be doing? Yes. Yes. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. Yes. The Father's laid upon the Son the iniquity of us all. We all make many mistakes. Some of them was much more than others. Some of our sins have, have been numbered above our heads. There's so many, there's thousands and tens of thousands of sins. Some of us have sinned to such a great degree. And I was numbered among those, unfortunately. But I'm not here to, you know, glorify sin. I'm just telling you my story. That for 29 years I lived like a fool. And how many knows that Jesus, he passes by even the fool's village at times. I think of as a young child that God passed through my life as a young child. And, and, and I, I was in my bedroom. I, the door was locked. It was the night before Easter. And I haven't told this to many congregations, but that night on the other side of my room, a bright light shined, and I saw an angel that night. And the angel said, come with me. And I'm standing there as a young boy, maybe five, six years old, and just, I'm not afraid because it was a good presence, but I was like, you know, just looking in, one, in wonderment, in amazement. And finally, after maybe a minute or so went by, the angel said, I'll be back, and just vanished away. God passed through my life as a young child. But my parents never taught me about the things of God. And, the, and you know, it just went about business as usual for another 12 years until I was about 20 years old where God passed through my life again. And at this time, I had already learned by the neighborhood boys that I hung around with who weren't church going boys, I learned how to lie and I learned how to cheat and I learned how to steal. I learned how to gamble, we learned how to drink, we learned how to use drugs and do all the things that you ought not to be doing as a man of God. But Jesus passed through again. I started dating this young lady and her dad was a born again believer. And he started reading to me the Bible and having me go to church. But how many knows that going to church and reading the Bible is not enough? No. You've got to make a decision in your heart that you're going to follow Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And this guy, he tried to sow good seed into my life. But for some reason, I just, I hadn't had enough of the world. I hadn't be, been beat up enough by the world. And Jesus passed through again. And he didn't come again for about another 10 years. And thank God I lived through those 10 years of times getting involved with, with drugs to a heavy degree, getting involved in gambling to a heavy degree. I had one time, a, I was high on cocaine and, and a man took a pistol right like this and pointed it right at my head. I thought my heart was gonna beat out of my chest that night. Another time I was leaving a bar room a guy came, rolled up behind me with a gun, put it right to my back. Another time I was confronted by an angry man the other side of the room with no way out but that doorway. He had a baseball bat in his hand. He was ready to make a paraplegic out of me. Another time I had a, a woman who was ready to take a knife and shove it through my chest. She had me quartered. I was chased through with a broken bottle. I was confronted with a fourth or fifth degree black belt. I mean, it was many times where my life could have been snuffed out in a moment's time. But thank God for the mercy and the grace of God. Amen. He kept me. 
Amen. My, I never knew it, but when I turned to be about 26 or 27, my mother had realized the, what, a, what a bad way that her son was going. And she had known a, a, quite a bit about Christianity as a young girl. She grew up in a church, church family. She went to Pentecostal church as a young girl, but never gave her life to Christ. But she understood a praying dad. And she understood a praying mother. And she understood how it works that God answers prayer. And she made a vow to God, if you can reach my son somehow, if you can just reach my son, I'll give my life to you. And she began to pray for several years. My mother began to pray, to cry out to God. And she told me she'd cry herself to sleep for about, a, for about two years straight. I'm talking about intercessory prayer that works. The effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous person availing much. Amen. And she continued to pray. And she continued to see my life go worse and worse. No, the faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. She wasn't walking by sight. She was walking by faith. Amen. She understood that there was a God in heaven that could change her son. She realized it was out of control. There was nothing that could be done in the natural. And she began to pray that God would send a man that could speak into my life. And I continued to use drugs. I continued to do the things that I was doing, gambling and all the other things that come with a, a, a worldly lifestyle. And I was involved with this girl and um, she didn't want me to be, I, I, was, I was so bad at that point, I was actually selling drugs. And she didn't want me to do that. And I had no intention of quitting, making this dishonest game, this easy money, because I grew up with the mentality that, you know, if you work for a living, you're a fool. That's what I learned as a young boy. My dad would take me to racetracks at about eight, nine years old. He would take me to racetracks I would see my dad, you know, involved in poker games. He made his living gambling for years. And this is what I learned. The people that worked for a living were fools. I, we were too smart to work for a living. You know, we don't have to work for a living. That's what foolish people do. They waste their time. And I continued to, to do my thing, and I made this plan in my head, well, I'll get a job and pacify her, but I'll continue to do my thing on the side. But little did I know that God had other plans. Amen. Yeah. I didn't know that mom was at home praying for the last two years that God would raise up a man and speak into my life. Hallelujah. I didn't realize that this guy was, was, prep, prep, was way worse than I had been. And God put me right alongside a born-again Christian. And he wasn't like an ordinary man. I don't know that I ever met anybody like him but before that time. Like I said, I hadn't gone to church very much. But this guy, when I looked into his face, I didn't see deadness like you look into a worldly man's face. I didn't see dark eyes as you look into a worldly man's eyes. This guy was lit up. The lights were on, my friend. And when he spoke, he didn't speak like a worldly man speaks. I didn't hear the swear words. I didn't hear the murmuring and the complaining, the gossip and the backbite, all the foolish talking that comes out of worldly people's mouth. I heard words that would edify and exhort and comfort and encourage my heart. And he began to speak life into my life. He began to tell me you keep living the way you're living, man. You're on your way to hell. You gotta change, man. You gotta go to church. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Hallelujah. Wake up, man. Hallelujah. It's no time to use drugs. It's no time to live like a fool anymore. And this guy began to get my curiosity. Like I said, I never read no Bible. But his words were different. Amen. They got a hold of my life. Ooh, and he spoke yeah. life into me. Yeah. And he, he encouraged me to read the Bible. And I'd drop off the girl, and she'd go work at her bar room and do her bar room thing. And instead of going out and use drugs now, I'd go home and I'd start reading the Bible. And I kept reading the Bible until the Bible read me. I kept reading the book until I looked into the book, and the book showed me that I was a mess, and I had to change. That my body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if I kept tempted, continue to use drugs and continue to live like a fool. I was on my way to hell in a handbasket and there was nothing that could be done for me. 
in a moment's time, my life could be snuffed out just like that. One more hit of cocaine, my heart could stop. One more hit of cocaine, I could have a stroke and end up in a wheelchair. One more hit of cocaine, it could lay me on a slab and put me in a morgue. And the epithet of my life could be fool, drug addict, loser. And I didn't want to wear that name tag, my friend. I continued to read that book. And the brother continued to encourage me. You gotta go to church, man. You gotta go to church. I didn't know nothing too much about church. We go to Catholic church a little bit. And if that's what religion was about, I didn't want that. That was too boring for me. But we had gone to this Pentecostal church a few times. As a young boy, my mother took me to this Pentecostal church. Similar to this, it was an Assembly of God church. Just similar to this church. And the pastor would preach. I think I started going there in late 1987. And the pastor would preach. And they would have an altar call. And I would answer the altar call. And this went on Sunday after Sunday for maybe a month or two's time. And I didn't really know what was happening. But the Holy Spirit was drawing me to himself. And he was convicting my heart of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he was showing me that I needed to repent and to change. To change my heart. To change my mind to change my thoughts, to think, change my actions, to change the places that I go, and the things that my hands touch, and the things my eyes look upon. I had to change. Amen. And as I continued to present myself before that holy altar, the Spirit would come upon me, and I began to cry like a baby. I began to, to weep, and weeks went by. And somewhere around the beginning of 1988, I started feeling this presence within myself. And I didn't know what had transpired at the time. But what had transpired is what is spoken of in the book of John chapter 3, where it says that you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must be born of water. You must be born again to see or to enter the kingdom. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, it says, If any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. It says in Romans 8, verse 16, it says, His Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. And that's what God was doing. He was showing me that something took place on the inside. I wasn't the same man that I used to be. Because if any man be in Christ, he be a new creation. All things are passed away. had taken place in my life. Yes. I didn't have to live in the past anymore. Amen. I didn't have to wear the name tag drug addict or a thief or a liar or adulterer. All things had passed away. One drop of the blood of Jesus Christ was sufficient to cleanse me from all sin and all unrighteousness and blot out the handwriting of ordinances that was against me and break down the middle wall of And I think of how um, my dad had witnessed this transformation. I forgot to tell you, as I got into my older years, in my 20s, me and my dad, we began to gamble together in card games. And we made a great deal of money, thousands and thousands of dollars that we made together. And my dad knew how dishonest I was and how that I learned how to lie and I learned how to cheat and I learned how to do drugs, and I learned how to live an evil way. But he witnessed the transformation. Uh, yeah. Amen. He was about 57 years old at the time, and he didn't immediately give his life to Christ. Amen. And I began to pray like my mother prayed for me. 
I began to pray for my dad. See, my mother came to faith soon. She kept her vow. She gave her heart to Christ. She got born again. She still serves Christ today at about age 83 or 84 years old. She's up there, but, she, but she's sticking to it. Amen. She's sticking to the commitment. But that didn't come so quickly. You know, we began to pray. I want you guys to take a look at the book of Luke. Chapter 26, I believe it is. Luke chapter 23, excuse me. Luke chapter 23. Starting at verse 34. It says, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his clothing, and they cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. He be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him, offering him vinegar, saying, if you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a subscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. One of the malefactors was hanged, railed on him, saying, If you be the Christ, save yourself and us. The other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you're in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. He said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. Here you got the conclusion of the lives of three grown men. They lived their lives, they all had an equal start in life. They lived a number of years. They all had an opportunity to do good or to do bad. They all had an opportunity to pray and to worship and to read the word of God or to be commandment breakers. And two chose to do the wrong thing, and one chose to do the right thing. Yes. But nonetheless, nails were driven through the hands and the feet of each one of these three individuals that got crucified that day on the cross at Calvary. And their life's blood is being poured out now. And two of them, their names aren't even mentioned. The historical fact of scripture calls them malefactors. In other words, they were career criminals. They were felons. They broke the laws of the land. They stole, they lied, they cheated, and whatever else they did. You fill in the blanks. I'm sure there's a long, big list that was above each one of their heads. They have been doing this a long, long time. And now the day of reckoning has come. It's the day of their death. And their blood's being poured out upon that cross just like the blood of the Lord Jesus was being poured out. And one guy wanted to hold on to the, this world. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. And take up his cross daily and follow me. Paul the Apostle said, I die daily. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live with the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. See, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to learn to die to what you want. Mm -hmm. Bible says if any man will, will keep his life, he's going to lose it. But if he'll lose his life for my sake, He's going to find it. Amen. Amen. It's time to cast off the works of darkness. Amen. It's time to put off the old man and the deeds thereof. Amen. It's time to put on the new man. Amen. 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 To walk in righteousness. Amen. To be 
a slave of righteousness, to be a holy man, a faithful man, a true man, a commandment keeper. It's time to forget about the foolish way of living. Yes. And that one thief, he began to rail on Jesus. You know, save us and we'll believe on you. And the other guy, after being a career criminal, after spending his whole life as a failure, malefactors written above his name, loser. You know the, the epitaphs that the world gives. You know, they don't even call people by names once they get so bad. He's a drunk. drunk. He's a dopehead. She's a prostitute. They can't even get their name called anymore. They're labeled by their sin. He's a liar. He's a thief. An adulterer. They're called malefactors. But the one malefactor, he said, listen, we deserve what we're getting. Mm -hmm. But this guy that's crucified with us, he's done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. And he said the best thing that he ever said in his whole life. He probably never said too many good things in his whole life. But this next thing that he said, it made all the difference in the world for his eternal salvation. Yes. He said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Amen. And what did Jesus say to him? This day, you shall be with me in This career criminal met the requirements of what it takes to experience eternal life. The forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, whose whole mission was to prepare the hearts of the people to receive the Holy Spirit. And his message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to say they repented, but there's no clearing of themselves. Mm -hmm. There's no vehement desire to change. There's no, there's, there's, there's no real repentance. Their mind hasn't changed. You know, some people, they're sorry they got caught, mm -hmm. but they're not sorry that they offended a just and a holy God. That's real repentance. He repented, you could see, because he corrected his friend. So his heart had changed towards what he had done in life. Yes. <clears throat> and he met the next requirement. When it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with a heart man believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth confessions made unto salvation. Hallelujah. He called him Lord. Hallelujah. He realized who was standing and who was being crucified alongside him wasn't just an ordinary man, yes. like some might want to call Jesus. Yes. Some said, well, this is the carpenter's son. Yes. You know, isn't he a son of Mary and Joseph? Yes. You know, we've ate with him, we've drank with him, we've seen him in church. Isn't this, you know, he was a carpenter's son. Yeah. Some thought he was a, you know, he was a good teacher. Some thought he was even a prophet. You know, some saw him as an apostle and a high priest of our profession. Who do you say, say that Jesus is? Peter says that you're the Christ. The Son of the Living God. Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He wasn't talking about Peter, the little rock, Cephas. He was talking about the profession of Peter's faith and who Christ was. This wasn't an ordinary man. This was God in the flesh. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Colossians that he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. John 1, 14, 
14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 13, 13, Jesus says, You call me Lord and Master, and you say well, for so am I. John 14, 6, He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. One of the disciples says, Show us the Father, and that will be enough. He says, have I been with you such a long time you don't know me? If you don't believe because of the words that I say, believe for the very work's sake. Nobody did what Jesus did. He opened blinded eyes. The deaf heard again. The dumb spoke. The cripples walked. Demons were cast out. He fed the thousands with a little bit of fish and a little bit of bread. He rose a man from the dead that was dead four days. They thought he was stinking. Amen. He cast the demons out of the demoniac of the Gadarene by the legion of demons. The Bible says that all the books, they couldn't even contain all the things that Jesus did. We just got a sprinkling of what he did. Yes. If you don't believe because of what he said, believe for the very work's sake. Mm -hmm. Nobody did what Jesus did. No. The one disciple understood it, doubting Thomas. He, you know, he, Jesus had showed himself after his passion to some of his disciples, but Thomas wasn't there in John chapter 20. He says, that unless I see the, the print in his hands, the piercing his side, I'm not going to believe. Jesus showed up, showed him the, the print in his hands, the place in his side. He said, don't be faithless, but believe him. Be believing. Thomas explains, my Lord and my God. Amen. Amen. The master of the universe, the greatest teacher of all mankind. Yeah. He let that statement stand because he was Lord and God. Yes. Amen. The statement stood. Amen. Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yes. The only God you'll ever see in heaven is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who houses the, the Trinity. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all contained in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That dying malefactor upon that cross that day, he understood who Christ was. Yes. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Hallelujah. He knew that Jesus wasn't going to die and the worms eat him in the grave. And he was just going to be like another ordinary man. But he realized he was going to come into his kingdom. Amen. And the Bible says that he rose again the third day. Hallelujah. He showed himself after his passion yes. to 500 eyewitnesses. Yes. I think of in the courts today, it takes just a, a witness or two yes. to find someone guilty. Yes. Well, there's great evidence to show that Christ is who he said he was. Amen. 500 eyewitnesses. Amen. And all of us here today that have Hallelujah. the precious Holy Spirit yes. are witnesses yeah. that Christ is alive.
about the winter of 1991, had a dream my dad wasn't going to be around very much longer. And I knew that God was speaking to me through that dream. And I shared the, the dream with my parents. And soon after that, maybe a few weeks or a month, my dad got diagnosed with terminal cancer. You know, the doctor told him, hey, there's nothing I can do for you. There's no need going through no treatments or nothing. It was in his pancreas. It was spreading. It was over. As far as the world is concerned, lights were out. You know, he was going to have a malefactor mm -hmm. on yes. his epitaph, of his yeah, greatest no, call. You know, you know I, as I was walking through the cemetery that day, you know, some people had nice scripture verses on their tombstones. Other people had worldly sayings. You know, but by my dad's tombstone, it was going to be malefactor. You know, but we continued to pray. <laughs> we continued to pray and not fast and pray. We gotta get serious now. Dad's diagnosed with terminal cancer. Ordinary prayer, you know, it might not be enough. The Bible says, you know, you know, there's some situations that it's gotta be fasting and prayer. Yes. You know, so we get to fast and pray now. And um, this missionary came up from South America. I think he was an Italian missionary. My dad was full blood Italian. He could speak the language. And just something told me to invite this missionary to come to the house and speak to dad. I talked to the man, and you know, he's probably a really busy man. Mm -hmm. You know, he's up from South America, he's got a limited amount of time to be in the States. But he took the time out of his day, he came to my dad's house. And me and the senior pastor and that missionary, we sat down at my dad's table in his dining room. And my dad gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I can't tell you that the cancer left that day because it didn't. The cancer went on for the next 30 days or so to take my dad's life. The Bible says that the outer man is perishing, but the inner man is renewed day by day. You know, some men, when they're dying, they're really afraid. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 2 that many people, they're held in bondage by the fear of death. Mm -hmm. See, they don't know where they're going to end up in eternity. Mm -hmm. See, there's one of two places we'll spend eternity, either with God and His people or away from God and His people. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know where they're going to spend eternity. They don't have what they call, what we sing about, that blessed assurance. Jesus. You know, I think of um, some guys, they know, they do have an assurance though. You can look in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah. When the king made that great statue and they asked all the world to bow before it, they said, we're not going to break the laws of our God. No. We, we don't care what you say, king. Yes. I'm not bowing before your idol. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they put their lives on the line because they weren't afraid of death. They understood it was more important to fear God and keep the commandments, which is the whole duty of man, than to bow before a pagan idol. Mm -hmm. And God, God validated them. The fourth man showed up in the fire. Amen. We see the prophet Daniel. The same thing happened to him. King Darius' decree went out. No man's to make any petition to anybody else. Mm -hmm. No other gods, no mm -hmm. rulers, mm -hmm. except for him for a 30-day period. Mm -hmm. And Daniel continued to do business with God as usual. Three times a day, he got down on his face. He prayed, he gave thanks, he worshiped God. Amen. And he found himself in the lion's den. But God sent the angel to close the mouth of the lion. Amen. Daniel wasn't afraid to die. Nope. Paul, Paul the apostle wasn't afraid to die. He knew he was going to Rome to be in prison. He said, none of these things move me. No. They don't move me. He said, I want to finish my course with joy. And keep, keep, the, keep the faith. I want to fulfill the ministry God's called me to and testify of the grace of God. Amen. These things don't move me. No. I understand for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I'm in a straight, a straight betwixt two. I don't know what I really want to do. I really want to go home and be with the Lord, but I know it's no more need for me to stay with you a short time longer. And Dad, you know, cancer continued to take his life. And I could see that, you know, the time's drawing close now. You know, his body, he was a big man, bigger than me. 
My dad was about 300 pounds at one point in his life, almost 6'5". When he's down to maybe 150 pounds, cancer's taken over. Time is short. And I see that, you know, my dad, he's really he's going down here quick. And God had already showed me the dream. He's not going to make it, you know. He's not going to make it through this one. And um, I start to cry. You know, when you lose your dad, it's a sad thing. And I start to cry, you know. My dad was a good friend of mine. And he says, don't cry, son. I got two days left. Who knows that? Yes. Unless the lights are on. Yes. Who knows that unless the lights are on? Yes. Who knows that unless they're having communication with the Heavenly Father? Yes. Who knows unless God's speaking into your life? Yes. Who can stand in the face of death and comfort his son who's whole? Yes. And he's cancer's taking his body and he's still doing the job of a father on his last few days. Yes. Just like Jesus was when he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I'm talking about something supernatural. Yes. Hallelujah. My dad didn't teach me a lot of lessons in life, my friends. But one thing he did teach me, he taught me how to leave this place. And not to be in love with this present world. He saw that, see my dad, he'd been gambling his whole life since a teenager. He understood odds. Mm -hmm. He understood probabilities, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He knew that the odds were stacked against him a hundredfold. But he understood that there was one named Jesus. Hallelujah! There was called the Savior of the world. And he wasn't just a figment of someone's imagination. Jesus was a historical figure who lived about 2,000 years ago, who was born of the Virgin Mary, conceived by the Holy Spirit, amen, lived up to be about 33 years of old, and his life was to be a ransom sacrifice for your sins and for my sins. He came into the world to save sinners. My dad understood that, amen. And he embraced Christ at the end of his life, just like that second malefactor did. And he become, became born again. Mm -hmm. And I believe I'll see my dad again in the yes! yes! See, one day, I don't care how bad your life gets. You can see in the book of Luke, where the book of Luke, it kind of brings it all together for us. There was two men that died. One was a rich man who lived sumptuously. He had the finer things of life. He had a nice house. He had the better meals to eat. He had the finer wardrobe, maybe the finer transportation of his day. Maybe he married one of the princesses. You know, everything was going good for the rich man. <laughs> Reminds me of another rich man who had, who had all, all the goods he needed, but he tore down his barns and he built bigger barns. But he didn't realize that he was going to die that night. His soul was going to be required of him. What can you give in exchange for your soul? What, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? You know, so you got these two men. You got one guy, Lazarus. Lazarus was a poor beggar who was so poor he desired to eat from the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Life didn't really go very well for him. And they both died. And Lazarus, the beggar, he, he became into Abraham's bosom. And then the, the rich man, he died. And he was tormented in this place where there was a flame. And he was so tormented, he called out to Lazarus, you know, can you just come and, and, and touch my tongue with a little dip of water? I'm tormented in this flame. And he's told there's a great gulf fixed between, between the two of you. No, nobody can pass that way or nobody can pass the other way. He goes, well, send, send someone to my brothers that they can testify that they don't come to this place of torment. He's let them hear Moses and the prophets. You know, there was no, there was no way to, 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 to minister to anybody. He was in a place of no more hope. And that's, the Bible says where it pointed out to men once to die, but after that the judgment. Let not nobody in this room end up in the condition of that rich man on Judgment Day. See, today's the day of salvation. Amen. If you hear His voice today, 
Don't harden your heart as it was in the day of provocation when the Israelites provoked God and thousands of them were destroyed by their provocation. Today is the day of salvation. If you're not right before God today, it's time to get right. Amen? Because not one of us have a contract with God that will live another day. You know, we could, we could drive home tonight, get out on the busy highway on 95, and who knows, a careless tractor trailer driver yeah. would run into one of us. Yeah. Maybe another one of these foolish people is going around shooting people, and we might get hit with a stray bullet. Mm. Heart attack. Mm. Who knows? <laughs> I don't wish none of this on any of us. Yeah. Yeah. But unless Jesus comes and raptures us up, we're all going to go the way of the grave one day. And some of us are getting pretty old now. Yes. We're going to go pretty soon. Yes. And it makes just good sense to me to serve God. Amen. Hallelujah. The rest of the days of my life. Hallelujah. Why should I try to hold on to something I cannot keep? Hallelujah. Amen. Except a grain of wheat fall against the ground and die and abides alone. But if it does, it brings forth a harvest. Hallelujah. See, when, I, when, I, when they plant me in the grave, I don't want to leave a big 401k plan to my children. I mean, that would be nice if I could. Yes. I don't I don't want to necessarily leave them a big house or a new car, you know, or even some type of, a, you know, anything the world could offer. But I want to leave them a heritage of a man that followed God. Amen. It didn't quit, but finished his course and kept the faith and fought a good fight and there was a crown waiting for him. I want them to be able to say, what I'm telling you today, that my dad made it to heaven, and I want to go there too. Amen. 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 That's the best heritage, my friends, Amen. that we can leave our children. Amen. A heritage of faith. Amen. Amen. And we'll not stagger against the promises of God through unbelief, but we'll be strong in faith, giving glory to God, despite the odds, despite the diagnosis of the doctor who says you have terminal cancer, but I'll continue to believe, amen, that I'm going to receive, and one day I'll walk the streets of gold, amen. Hallelujah. And one day I'll sit down at the marriage wedding supper of the Lamb, amen. That one day I'll be at a place where there's no more pain, there's no more sorrow. There's no more tears. There's no more yeah. death. There's no more yeah. suffering. The former things are going to yeah. pass away. And God's going to make all things new. Amen. And one day or a thousand days will be like nothing. There'll be millions of days. There'll be billions of days. It'll go on and on forever in a place with God and his people. Yeah. I look forward to that. You see the patriarchs, yes. you see the matriarchs, you yes. see the prophets, the apostles, yes. you see Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. I want to see Jesus, yes. the one who loved me enough to die in my place. Yes. See, my friend laid down his life for me. How much more should I lay down my life for him? Greater love that no, has no man in this but to lay down his life for his friend. Are you willing to lay down your life for your friend Jesus today? Amen. He did it for you. He showed you the way. Amen. My dad showed me the way how to die. Amen. And I want to die the same way that he died when I die if I don't get raptured first. That would be nice. I hope that's the way. But if not, I want to die in faith believing. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a word. What a word. Thank you, Lord. Let's stretch our hands towards this man of God. Let's pray that God will continue to use him greatly for his kingdom. Oh, man. You don't know how much I was eating, eating and drinking. The word of God as this man anointed by God to share with us. Father God, everyone pray for Pastor. Father God, we thank you for our dear brother. We thank you for the testimonies of his life. Father God, I was not ashamed to see where he was and to see the great work that you can do. The Bible says you raise up the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Oh, Father God, may your anointing that breaks the yoke remain upon him and that of his family. Le cabron de asada. A.C.K. do para asaya. Teki dey li broma ba A.C.K. Alondo. Rikri amasuta. No matter how many more years he has. 
Father God, let this anointing and the vibrance of how the unadulterated word of God come through him continue wherever he goes. Use him to bring many into the kingdom of God. Open doors to the blind, open doors to the lost using this vessel. Thank you for his life and that of his family and their friends in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. What a blessing.